That song always is going to bring some tears, no matter how many times you hear it. And as I was listening to it, I was thinking about Jerry just right across the train tracks. That was the thing I was thinking about. But um, if you have your Bible with you this morning, and I hope you do, if you would turn with me to Matthew 16, verse 18. Why are you looking for that? You know, back in 1961, now a lot of y'all probably weren't around. I was only about a year and a half old myself, so uh, I don't remember this speech other than what I learned in history class growing up. But in the inaugural address on the 20th of January, 1961, President Kennedy urged American citizens to participate in, a, in public service. And his quote was, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I've heard it quoted many, many times in my lifetime. But that was the predecessor to the birth of the Peace Corps. Peace Corps was something that was a non-military group that they sent out and they sent young American, most of them were college students or fresh out of college. They sent them to foreign lands to go over and teach them how to do agricultural. Uh, they sent some over to teach them how to build buildings and you know all different walks of life, but they sent them over to foreign countries to help out in a promotion of peace of harmony, that we could work with other countries in harmony. You know, as Baptists, we have the North American Mission Board and the International Mission Board. You know, the Southern Baptist Convention was formed in 1845, mainly to create these two mission boards. That's the whole idea behind the Southern Baptist Convention, was to combine mission efforts between the, these two so I said International Mission, North American Mission. Back then it was called the Foreign Mission Board and the Domestic Mission Board, which later came the International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board. The only difference between our mission boards and the Peace Corps is one major difference. We go out to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through that, we are also promoting peace and working with others. But that's the only main difference in the two because our missionaries go out, they help to work with people how to build buildings. They're not just going out and carrying religious tracts around. I've been on mission trip myself. Melanie and I know a few others have been on mission trip here. I went down and helped to build a caretaker's cottage on a youth camp down in Costa Rica several years ago. We weren't going in there toting our Bibles and, and preaching and teaching to the people. We were helping to build buildings, but through that they knew that we loved them enough and that Jesus Christ loved them enough that he sent us down there to work with them. Sad to say, but we are raising a generation of dependence now. We are raising a generation in our nation today that think that the government's going to take care of everything for them. We're raising a group of people now that they want to know what they can get, not what they can give. And or they are willing to do anything as long as they do not have to work for it. As long as they don't have to do the work, they're willing to do anything. It's sad that we have got it to that point in our civilization today. And the thing is, God will not continue to bless us as a nation if we don't break these habits and get away from them. So my title today, in case you didn't see it there in the bulletin, is Ask Not What the Church Can Do For You. I chose Matthew 16, verse 18 for this reason. Jesus is setting the groundwork for his church in this one verse as he is talking to Simon Peter. And he says this, he said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock 
I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I can just stop right there. In that one verse, Jesus tells us what's going to happen. He tells us that he is going to build his church, not on Peter himself. We don't pray to St. Peter. We don't pray to any man. We pray to God. We pray to Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. But we do not pray to any man. We can pray for everyone. We should. But never should we pray to anyone. Not an athlete, not a politician, not a preacher. None of us are worthy of that. Only God is worthy of our prayers. But he says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That tells us in a cut and dried situation, Jesus Christ is going to produce his church. He is going to build his church and nothing Satan can do can tear it down. Nothing man or Satan can do to tear it down. But I said, we often want to look at it and say, what can the church do for me? Well, you are the church. Each and every one of us are the church. Now, the basic understanding of the church in the New Testament requires answers to three basic questions. What does the word church mean? That's number one. What are the characteristics of a church? And last, how did the early church grow and expand? Or how can we continue to make our church grow and expand? That's the easier question. How can we? Now the first is the church. Now the church is the English translation of the Greek word ecclesia. Ecclesia. It's where we get ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastes. But the Greek term meant simply this, the called out. And it was commonly used to indicate an assembly of citizens of the Greeks. It was used in Acts 19, verse 32. It says, Some therefore cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. At that point in time, the church, the church was in its infancy. It was dazed and confused, I guess is the easiest way to say it. They were not sure quite exactly how they needed to go. They knew God was calling them to do something, but they weren't quite sure how. And the whole time, God was working in the midst of them and working through the Apostle Paul and all the other disciples. They were working there to get things laid out, to get a, a structure there. That's where we get the term of a church as being a building is the structure that it takes to bring those believers together. A church is simple. It's a body of believers. It's not a building. It's not a bricks and mortar building. A church is simply a body of believers. In Acts 19, 39, it says, But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. They brought forth law. They brought forth some order to the church. They were bringing the church together as one body. A body in Christ where Jesus Christ stands as the head. I'm not the head of this church, nor the deacons or anyone else in this building is the head of this church. Jesus Christ is the head of our church. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So when early Christians were coming together and trying to understand themselves, they were trying to constitute a church. It said no doubt exists that they perceived themselves as called out by God in Jesus Christ. They were called out for a special purpose and that their status was a privileged one in Jesus Christ. It's a privilege to be a Christian. It's a privilege to have a Lord and Savior known as Jesus Christ.
We should never consider it to be derogatory to us in any way that we are Christian. Some may want to make us that way. Some may want to talk down to us. Call you names and everything else. I said, thank you. Because you know the only one I've got to please in this world is God. That is the only one I have to please because when I walk through the gates of heaven, he's going to be standing there. And I'm going to have to atone for everything I've done in this lifetime. And each and every one of us. And he is the only one that I'm looking for praise from. When I walk in, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter there into that reward. That's the words I'm looking forward to hearing. 